Blenheim Palace, one of the grandest of all Britain's great houses. For centuries, these estates were miniature kingdoms, where everyone understood the rules and played their role. This is the story of how the First World War began the destruction of so many of these perfect worlds. Four years of horror which notice on the old order. I'm Julian Fellows, and when I created Downton Abbey, I wanted to tell the story of this very moment in our history. There will be explosions on this time. And passion! I wrote how the lives of the family and the servants were changed, and even ripped apart by war. We showed the women who went to work, and we watched as the doors of the house were thrown open to receive the wounded. Now I want to tell you about the men and women of a real house, Blenheim Palace, the war stories of a real Downton Abbey. This is this very room, transformed into a convalescent ward. <laughs> Below stairs, I'll discover tales of heroism and tragedy. Now, this is very different from taking orders from the Ninth Duke. And upstairs, I'll seek out those who seize their chance to change. She doesn't look very retiring. She and the Bulldog have much in common. And I will explore the making of Blenheim's most famous son. Churchill was desperate to get in on the action. Now, this is a real. This is this a is real. The, this, this, is, this is the original. I hardly dare touch it. The First World War would completely change the lives of the men and women who went through it world they'd die in would bear almost no resemblance to the world of their beginnings. It was a momentous time for Blenheim, and by the end, Britain would be transformed. Blenheim Palace was built in 1722, an extraordinary physical manifestation of the power and status of the Churchill, later Spencer Churchill, dynasty. Dukes of Marlborough were the head of the family, kings in their own land. Eighty servants ran the house and gardens. 145 farms were worked by tenant farmers and laborers. The house dominated the town of Woodstock just beyond its walls. Its children attended Blenheim schools. Shopkeepers and craftsmen depended on the house for their livelihoods. And so it remained until the Great War. So what was life like at Blenheim before the Duke inherited? Blenheim was almost bankrupt. His father had sold much of the collection. The whole estate was tottering, and it needed a vast injection of money to get it up and running again. And Consuela Vanderbilt could provide it. The Vanderbilt family had built one of America's largest shipping and railway fortunes, and Consuelo's father, or rather her ambitious mother, had settled a dowry on her, making her an attractive proposition for an impoverished English duke. But for all her striking beauty, there was never any attraction between bride and groom. And here they are, Consuelo and Sonny, the ninth duke, making a more convincing couple in marble than they ever did in life. In truth, this was a business deal. He got Consuelo's millions, her mother got a duchess for a daughter. For the people of Woodstock, this was like a royal wedding, and their future prosperity lay in the gift of the happy couple. They were married towards the end of 1895 in New York, but they took a long honeymoon tour, which unfortunately only really served to show they didn't like each other very much. Uh, but anyway, they arrived back here in the spring of 1896. Of course, it was a fantastic event for the town. There was bunting and flags everywhere. The whole population turned out to welcome the glamorous new American duchess. And all the dignitaries were in their robes. And there was even a squadron of the Queen's own Oxford Chazars there to welcome them. Consuelo's reception was cooler once she entered the palace. There she met her new in-laws the Spencer Churchill family. This is the grand dining room where yeah. most of the meals were taken. Absolutely fabulous room, this. Lady Henrietta Spencer Churchill is Consuelo's great-granddaughter. 
And this is Tim, who's our butler. Oh, hello. Julian Hi. Fellows. Hi. So, Tim has very kindly laid the table as it would have been set during that time. Oh, fantastic. So this is Consuelo arriving on her first night here. Well, you have to remember, she was only 19 when this marriage was arranged. And I think she found it particularly difficult dealing with the hierarchy of the staff. At that time at Blenheim, there were probably up to 80 household staff. Yeah. And, you know, there's this wonderful story when she wants um, fire lit and she calls for the butler. The butler says, um, that's actually not my job. I'll just call for the footman to light the fire. She says, don't worry, I'll do it myself. <laughs> I think the other tough thing for Consuelo was that she was suddenly engulfed by this huge Churchill family. One tale describes them as a signal for the ladies to leave the table. But her husband's aunt, the formidable Lady Sarah Wilson, had been running the house before Consuelo arrived and she expected to retain this role. And I think Lady Sarah was one of the few daughters who was still at home. So she sort of felt, well, who's this sort of American upstart coming to take my place as hostess? But in fact, it was Consuelo's job to get up sure. and lead the ladies out and then she she rose and st intercepted her at the door and said are you ill are you ill i love that <laughs> and when lady sarah denied it she said oh i thought you must be ill because you're leaving early and <laughs> and that was the end of I that rebellion I bet she didn't do that again in a hurry you know she was determined to make her mark and show that she was rightfully the hostess and good for her and that was her business absolutely such pettiness was made irrelevant in August 1914 with the declaration of war. Men clamored to enlist and women from all classes looked to play a part, but I was surprised to discover that Lady Sarah Wilson was one of the first to answer the call, that she would leave the lavish surroundings of Blenheim with its staff happy to wait on her hand and foot and instead volunteer for service. I have here the medal card, something I didn't know existed, of Lady Sarah Wilson. Here she is listed as being at the Allied Forces Base Hospital, uh, which must mean that she went abroad, she went either to the front or near the front at any rate. So she was not simply sitting at home knitting socks for soldiers, she was in the thick of it. Uh, and I am going to try and find out a bit more about that. Lady Sarah was no stranger to war. When her officer husband, Gordon Wilson, went to fight in the Boer War, she followed, rather incredibly finding fame as the first female war correspondent, becoming something of a feminist heroine. But her activities during the Great War are less well known. So I'm in London to find out more at the Royal Society of Medicine's library to meet historian Alison Fell. I have the medal card of Lady Sarah Wilson. But what did she actually do out there? Well, I've got an article from a newspaper. This is shortly after the outbreak of war. Hospital at the front. I propose to run the hospital under the auspices of the Red Cross Society to engage the best available surgeons and nurses. This stationary hospital of 200 beds has been gratefully accepted by the French ambassador on behalf of the French government for English and French wounded. And it would have involved an awful lot of negotiation with a number of different people setting up a hospital. And so to have to deal with the military authorities, with the Red Cross, to win people around. This is her, is it? It is. <laughs> See her confidence, I think. Yes, she doesn't look very retiring. She and the Bulldog have much in common. Indeed. I mean, if she had been timid and vaguely inquiring as to whether or not she could be useful, she wouldn't have got anything like as much done. And I think they would have seen, although they weren't right at the uh, at the front yeah but they the saw the men coming in absolutely a world away from her life receiving guests in a sumptuous palace as lady sarah put herself with an earshot of artillery fire at the same time her husband colonel gordon wilson was somewhere on the front line i have here the war diary it's quite difficult to read colonel wilson killed so he was killed Oh, in November of the first year of the war, so almost immediately. So she would have found out quickly. Yeah. And I think three days later, she went back to Britain to arrange the funeral. And then only two weeks after that, she went back out to France to the hospital. Two weeks later? Yeah. Colonel Wilson was killed at the First Battle of Ypres in the autumn of 1914. And his death cut short a marriage of almost 23 years. 
But a loss such as Lady Sarah's would soon become all too common. Quite a lot of the women I've looked at who volunteered to go and do war work in France had been either widowed or had lost a son, which is interesting. Nursing their patients as if they were their son or their husband. So I think it was a way of coping with separation and then sometimes with loss. I mean, you know, even in my own family, my grandfather died in 1915, my uncle died in 1918, mm -hmm. uh, lots of cousins. They all had men they loved who were at the front. Yeah. And an astonishing number of families were touched mm. by death. Grief united women from all classes, leaving more than 200,000 British widows. Sarah Wilson devoted herself to helping wounded men in France for a further two years. I have another document here that we found from 1916. Lady Sarah Wilson has her own hospital which a man who was nursed there told me was the jolliest place to be ill it was possible to imagine. He said Lady Sarah herself was a veritable tonic, so bright and cheery was she always. I don't think Consuelo would have recognized I, this I was, portrait. I was just about to say what a different picture of her we get there. Before the war, I don't think she was a nice person. Mm. She certainly was extremely unpleasant mm. to Consuelo when she first arrived at Blenheim, bullying. In some ways, maybe, a war gives a woman like Sarah Wilson the opportunity to use skills in a way that had to public acclaim and she felt... Her really. Her rival Consuelo had moved on too. She'd done her duty by bearing two male children, an heir and a spare, then fled the palace for London to get away from the husband she loathed. There she dedicated herself to helping women in the workplace. It's ironic that at the same time, her estranged husband, Sonny, played a key role in getting women into work. Under his leadership, women of every class took up jobs previously reserved for men. It was a change that would alter things irrevocably long after the war was over. I'm meeting Michael Waterhouse, the ninth Duke's great-grandson. He founded this women's land court that became the land army that we know so much about from the Second World War. Well, the Second World War, we always think it's yeah. the Second we World War it's phenomenon. Second, but it's not. It's Sonny Marlborough as, as a junior minister of agriculture. And he encouraged women to come forward to work on the estate because all the men went off to the front. The Duke didn't stop there. He offered this very formal long library for service. Before the war, it had accommodated grand balls and glittering receptions. And it would have been unthinkable to it filled with sick beds. Do you know, this is this very room transformed into uh, a convalescent ward. I find there's something very moving in that, really, wanting to involve even the house. He really made Blenheim uh, play its part in the war. You know, ploughing up the sheep walks for arable, planting cabbages in the herbaceous borders. He saw himself as a great Englishman, and he was going to do his bit for Britain, and he was jolly well also, as minister, going to use his influence to encourage other people to follow his example. This was before the National Health Service, and it was vital that these great families got involved, because in the First War, their houses were not requisitioned. They had to be offered freely by their owners. By the end of the war, 3,000 buildings became temporary hospitals. And in these hospitals, on the land and in munitions factories, two million British women took the place of the men who'd gone to fight. Their service would prompt first concessions, allowing women the right to vote. But it was the men of Blenheim who faced the horrors of the front line. Above stairs and below stairs, they volunteered to fight for their way of life. I'm going in search of two young men from very different backgrounds. One, Arthur Hine, a lowly clerk on the estate. Sergeant Hine, attached to the intelligence department. The other, Winston Churchill, the undisputed star of the Churchill family. There's absolutely no doubt that he did experience firsthand. Blenheim Palace. For 300 years, this has been the home of the Dukes of Marlborough, head of the Churchill family. They created this jewel in 30,000 acres of Oxfordshire, where their money and status offered security to all around them. In return, their servants and 
local people deferred to them, trusting them with their lives. But when the First World War broke out, this ancient system was put to the test. All the great and the good of Blenheim and people who worked for them found themselves involved in world events, and nobody was keener to get stuck in than Winston Churchill. This is what he wrote to his wife. My darling one and beautiful, everything trends towards catastrophe and collapse. I am interested, geared up and happy. Is it not horrible to be built like that? It shouldn't surprise us too much that Winston Churchill was so anxious for glory in politics and in warfare. This is where he was born, and Blenheim Palace is a house built on war. Throughout his young life, Winston had a constant reminder that war was in his blood. His ancestor, John Churchill, won a famous victory over France. He was rewarded with Blenheim and a dukedom. Well, this is the column raised to the memory of the first Duke of Marlborough with an incredibly splendid inscription, which is pretty florid. A monument designed to perpetuate the memory of the signal victory obtained by John, Duke of Marlborough, the hero not only of his nation but his age, who by military knowledge and irresistible valor rescued the empire from desolation, asserted and confirmed the liberties of Europe. I think it was terribly important to Winston Churchill to prove that he was a worthy successor to his great ancestor and when the war started he was very anxious to make his mark not very surprisingly his thoughts turned to a cavalry regiment that was local to Blenheim and on the 4th of August the Woodstock branch of the Queen's own Oxfordshire Hussars received a cable with a single word mobilize with that one word Churchill called on the ancient bonds of loyalty he expected in Blenheim men it meant that they would be among the first to see action. I'd love to know more about their war. Deep in the bowels of the palace, I'm meeting Benham's historian, Karen Wiseman. Wonderfully Edwardian faces. This is Maisie. Then there are four Hollises um, dotted around. This is one of the Hollises, and they worked as footmen. And then you see this lovely man... But all, all four brothers were footmen? Were, were all in the palace, yes. They were all listed as working for the butler. Tell me that some of them survived the war. Um, two of them did not, and two of them did come home. Oh, God. And then over here, we have Arthur Hine, lovely fresh-faced young man. And yeah, God, they were so young. Oh. And the Hine family have worked for Blenheim for many generations. If I just show you this photograph album here, I need to just put yeah, it across. Now, this was a gift to the Ninth Duke and Duchess when they got married. And when you turn the pages, you'll see they're all dressed in oh, I see. Sunday best with their names underneath. Oh, and it's all the estate workers and house workers. And all the tenants. And if you keep going a little way till you get to the name Hine. Oh, here we go. Yes. Now, here is Josiah Hine and J.E. Hine. Josiah Hine was estate clerk and then his son J.E. Hine comes and joins them. Beautiful book isn't it? Yeah. If we have a, a little look at this enormously heavy ledger. Just <laughs> Marvellous isn't it? Look at the beautiful handwriting. Oh and here is AR, this is Arthur presumably. Mm -hmm. Is this when he joins the office? Yes. He's yes. not paid as much as his dad but he's paid. Yes. And you can see he's given quite particular Oh jobs. drawing plans and plotting land. Mm. One last show you about Arthur Hine is we bring it up to the 1914 period. Oh yeah, A.R. Hine is missing so I suppose that means he... he's gone off to war. He's gone off to war. Mm. He's gone off to war. Up to this point much of Arthur Hine's experience of military life had been in the Hussars regular training camps at Blenheim where he would have encountered Winston Churchill. The war wrenched Hine from this secure world. In September 1914, he was in France with the Hussars. They expected a quick and glorious victory and to be back at Blenheim for Christmas. Where is Dunkirk? Dunkirk is just inside France here. Yes, I see. I'm meeting military historian Chris Baker. He's made a discovery about Arthur Hine's first experience of war. So Churchill has decided to send over the Hussars 
and Hein goes with them, presumably. Yes. Do, do we have anything of his actual career once he crossed over? Well, what we know is that he was a dispatch rider message carrier. An article appeared in the press. Oh, this is nice. Sergeant Hein of Woodstock, attached to the intelligence department, went through the bombardment of Antwerp and was at the firing lines at the forts. Officer. His name was Major Fines. 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 Now, he's been Churchill's parliamentary private secretary for a while. And of course, the two, with their connection to the men of Blenheim, uh, Arthur would have been known to them. Um, and if you're going to be sent into a, a, a fast moving and dangerous situation, well, take a man you trust. The besieged Belgian city of Antwerp was on the brink of surrender to Germany. Winston Churchill became the loudest advocate of a British mission to save the city, which sent local Blenheim man Arthur Hein into the fray as a dispatch rider. The Germans brought up what for the time was the heaviest artillery in the world. They begin a deliberate, steady, heavy bombardment of the city. Five shells per minute falling into the packed city center. You can imagine the scene of buildings falling, of fires breaking out, very frightening, chaotic. Riding his motorcycle through Antwerp, Arthur Hein found himself in the thick of the chaos. Amid the terrible scenes he witnessed was the sad plight of a poor girl who had crawled from the cellar of a burning house, leaving her parents inside. Sergeant Hein offered her a lift on the motorcycle he was riding. With great difficulty, he was able to get to Ostend and brought the refugee home to England, where she is being well cared for by his parents. What an extraordinary story. I don't think there is much doubt that Arthur was given some kind of special mission to go home. Because he couldn't, he'd have been court martial if he just Absolutely, lived. you couldn't just do that. The first thing Churchill would want to know is what really happened. Yes, absolutely. And an eyewitness account was, was clearly essential. The regimental history hints that he went to London on arrival in England, which again sort of reinforces the possibility. Wretched Belgian girl clinging to his waist <laughs> the whole time. Antwerp quickly fell to Germany, and 30,000 Belgians lost their lives. Arthur Hein soon returned to the front, although his role as Churchill's messenger was no longer apparent. He marched into the first Battle of Ypres as a regular soldier the same bloody battle that killed Blenheim's Colonel Gordon Wilson. By January of 1915, he was in hospital suffering from shell shock. Having seen such horrors, you'd think at the end of the war he'd want to scuttle home to this safe haven. But in fact, he went to work for the railways and never returned to Blenheim. So what kind of man was he? Here we are. To see what she knows, and also to tell her what I've discovered. And it is an extraordinary, extraordinary design, you think. And there's the first duke on his column, you see. Ah. Oh. Fantastic. Oh, I'm there. just going to yeah. show you. This is uh, the Queen's own Oxfordshire Hussars. And this chap is Arthur Hind. Oh, my goodness me. He looks so young, doesn't he? It's just heartbreaking. He looks so small. Really. So small. And young. So small. Did you get to know him well then? He came to our wedding, and I've got a picture. With oh, I'd me. love to see it. Where is it? With me. And um, there he is. Oh, but you see, he's quite sort of mm. stylish, isn't he? Mm. And he was always well dressed. But I mean, the way he holds himself. Yes. You can yes. see he's a military man. He certainly was a character, as you can see. I know, no, you can yeah, see it in that, actually. Uh, oh, extraordinary, really. And he used to come to our house and he used to go, bang, 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 Hein here. Hein here. Mm, and he would never, like, when I used to say Grandad, he used to say, no, it's Hein. Oh, and you had to call him Hein? Mm, mm. Mr mm. Hein or just Hein? No, just Hein. He would just turn up out of the blue and I used to say, I'll cook dinner, whatever. No, give me a cup of tea. Got to be on the next train. Got to Look be back on the train. Got to be back, back to Tiverton Parkway. It was very strange. It seems, forgive me for saying, slightly dysfunctional. Mm. All that, and mm. I wonder. I mean, he did have a kind of breakdown, really. Mm. Um, but actually, he 
a very splendid war. He worked in the intelligence. He was taking messages, we think, probably, to Churchill from um, the front. So he was a very gallant figure in that bit. And he had this extraordinary adventure at the end of the siege of Antwerp. Um, do, you, you, do you know about his rescuing? No. no. None of that. It's all Nothing. secret. Well, amid the terrible scenes he witnessed was the sad plight of a poor girl who had crawled from the cellar of a burning house, leaving her parents inside. And Sergeant Hine offered a lift on the motorcycle he was riding and brought the refugee home to England where she is being well cared for by his parents. My goodness me. Isn't that oh. extraordinary? I mean, a real adventure. To think he had so many stories to tell. I know. And... And he couldn't tell them. No. He was just a man of mystery. Bang, bang, Hein here. I have a sort of renewed vision of Arthur Hein as an older man, really. This almost Pinteresque figure who always had to be going to the station and was always late. But I think what it tells us more than anything is the rupture that the war brought. I mean, here he was, a Blenheim man. He knew that that man had gone and he had become someone else. And the only way he could really deal with it was to reinvent himself and start again. I find that very poignant. And I'm afraid there were many, many men who felt exactly like that. And what of that other Blenheim man who had sent Arthur Hine to war? Winston Churchill's failure to save Antwerp began the most disastrous slide in his public career. Blenheim Palace, home of the Dukes of Marlborough. The first Duke's great victory over France brought the family wealth and influence. And the man most likely to follow in his footsteps was Winston Churchill. But the Great War threatened to defeat his ambition. As First Lord of the Admiralty, he was held responsible for the disastrous invasion of Gallipoli in Turkey. 50,000 Allied troops lost their lives. Churchill was forced out of office and his reputation was ruined. His response was to go to the Western Front himself as an ordinary battalion commander. This is the Cambridge College that bears his name. The letters he wrote to his wife throughout the war are kept here. Alan Packwood is the director of the Churchill Archives. He decides to go to the front to face the danger, to be with the men who are fighting, and, you know, very possibly to be killed. He was enormously brave in the face of really whatever happened to him. There's absolutely no doubt that he did experience firsthand the, the full horror of the trenches. And you might want to have a look at a uh, key passage on this letter here. Well, this is a real, this is this a is real the, letter. This, 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 this is the original, this is Churchill writing back to his wife. How did I touch mm. it? So this passage down yeah. here particularly. I am sure I am going to be entirely happy out here and at peace. It's an interesting choice of words at the front. I must try to win my way as a good and sincere soldier, but do not suppose I shall run any foolish risks or do anything which is not obviously required. Always your devoted and loving husband, Winston. There's absolutely no doubt that he was personally brave and that he was very resolute under fire. And that's brought very vividly to life by this letter back to his wife, Clementine, from November 1915. So this is the original letter. We have this, this transcript for you here. You'd rather I touch that than that, Of course. You? I know your sort. My darling, we have finished our first 48 hours in the trenches. It is a wild scene, filth and rubbish everywhere. Graves built into the soil, God. water and muck on all sides, and about this scene in the dazzling moonlight, troops of enormous rats creep and glide to the unceasing accompaniment of rifle and machine guns and the venomous whining and whirring of the bullets which pass overhead. But in the horror and the mud of the trenches, Churchill began to win his way back as a leader. He always felt that he was a natural commander of men. But he does win them over by taking a keen interest in their, in their welfare. One of the first things he does is to declare war on the lice. He lays on entertainment for them. He lobbies to have his troops built back up to complement. There was this kind of ancient arrangement that the, the townspeople or the, or the town 
and farmers would give deference in return for protection. That's the tradition from which Churchill comes. Mm. He clearly won them over and proved himself actually quite an inspirational commander. Must have been incredibly relieving, actually, for his men, that they knew they had someone who was on their side taking an interest, and more to the point, had contacts right at the top of the stairs. I think Winston Churchill is one of those people who was changed better by the First World War. That very aristocratic sense of entitlement, rather unquestioned, rather arrogant, really, seemed to develop into something kinder and more responsible and more modern. I suppose in a way, one could say, the First World War made him the man to win the Second World War. The war was dragging Blenheim and its people into the future, whether they wanted it or not. The fact is, who gave the orders and who took them was changing, and a new force was emerging, the middle class. Huge, huge family, family, yes. I'm interested in how these changes affected a soldier from a solid Blenheim working family. Yes, George Farley was the founder of George Farley and Son was the firm. House painter, house painter. Genealogist Mary Evans has been digging into this long line of painter decorators who for generations kept the palace pristine. And if we look in the estate ledgers, we can see George Farley and Sons. 1898. 1898, So it wasn't yes. long after the Duchess's dollars had arrived that we have the kickoff. That's right, yes, indeed. Um, we had them again a little bit later on. In... And what level are we talking So bedrooms and passages or state rooms? All sorts. We have one here, look, colouring the walls, etc., in the Long Library. Oh, OK. Well, this is 1903. grown-up stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mary has found the war record of one member of the Farley family. Albert Frederick Farley. And he joined up on the 15th of September. 1915, so that's before conscription. Conscription yes. didn't come in until the following year. Oh, offence. This is only for reporting offences. This is for the offences, yes. When on active service, not complying with an order, which sounds very serious, although in brackets it says, i.e. not cleaning cooking utensils when oh, ordered. When ordered. Yes, I'm, I'm so slightly with Albert over that one, so I don't, I don't want to hold that against it. <laughs> The 13th of March, 1916. Disobedience to standing orders, i.e. crossing land during prohibited hours. And again, the 27th, being late on parade. Not so bad. Well, not so bad, but I mean, it's, it's, it's slightly massed. You know, they're having to write little yes. to get it all in. And here we have refusing to obey an order, which I'm afraid this time is not qualified. And the last word, missing. It's rather sad, isn't it? You think he volunteered to protect his country and went off brave and it, it hasn't gone well from the beginning. So the question is, what happened to him? I want to discover why this eager young recruit behaved so badly and what lay in store for him and this great house that had shaped the universe in which he born and raised. Before the First World War, Blenheim employed 25 craftsmen, from water engineers to carpenters. The Farley family were decorators and had painted these rooms for generations. They were loyal workers and well looked after. I've come to Balliol College in Oxford to meet military historian Gary Sheffield. I'm hoping he can explain why, after volunteering for the army, a member of that family should acquire such a bad disciplinary record. Albert Farley, I imagine fairly straightforward, the man comes from a good background and it goes so wrong for him. Do we know more about these offences and this punishment? It says there, uh, FP for field punishment number one, which is the most serious one, probably next to executions, the most controversial part of British discipline in the First World War, but it involved tying a soldier to a fixed object two hours a day for 21 days. And we've actually got an account by another soldier of his reaction. I saw that one of the artillerymen was stretched out, cruciform fashion, his arms and legs wide apart, secured to the wheel. His head lolled forward as he shook it to drive away the flies. And that seemed 
face of this half-crucified gunner got us all groggy. Mm. That's terrible, isn't it? It's utterly inhumane. Albert bore his punishments and fought in ghastly conditions in the Battle of the Somme during the wet autumn of 1916. It was one of the bloodiest battles in human history. But even this nightmare cannot fully account for Albert's bad record. Most other soldiers who went through the same hell fell into line. We don't know precisely what order he disobeyed, but we do know something about the background. Have a look at um, this entry in the Battalion War Diary. Relieved by the 6th Battalion of the Queen's Regiment, very quiet but wet, march to Bernevis. Still it's poor, place all mud and slush. Yes, uh, I mean, that's the key to it, isn't it? I think it is. After terrifying days and nights in the trenches, billets, temporary living quarters at a safe distance from the front, were meant to offer desperately needed respite. One of the central facets of being an officer that would have been drummed in to people going through officer cadet units in places like this Oxford College is that your first and foremost responsibility is to look after the comfort and well-being of your men. Sure, not to pour yourself an enormous whiskey. In
Sonny had dedicated his life to Blenheim and he couldn't stop now. He carried on spending her money on the house and these spectacular gardens. His grandson, the 11th Duke, has built on Sonny's lifelong obsession with Blenheim and turned it into a modern business, open to the public, but still his home. He started with the Italian gardens before the First World War, and then where we're sitting now, the water terraces he did after the First World War, from 1925 to about 1930. Just when a lot of other families were pulling in their horns, he was making Blenheim more splendid than ever before. That's correct. I mean, it is extraordinary when you think of that. Like Barter appearing at Blenheim. Yeah, it's, well, I mean, it's wonderful that it exists today, and we're trying to keep it going. The Churchill family, and in fact, the whole Blenheim community, had entered the Great War, still governed by the ways of the 19th century. They emerged from it to find themselves in the 20th. That pre-1914 existence may have lingered on for a few years in some of these houses, but the mindset had changed. The clarity of the old world, where most people accepted the role they were born to and lived by its rules, that had been replaced by something very different. Better, maybe, but definitely more uncertain. And we head to another grand house this weekend as the new series of Downton Abbey continues Sunday at nine. Then we brand new drama for you next week as James Norton stars as a vicar on a mission. That's Grandchester, Monday at the same time. Here next, with all the latest headlines, we've the ITV News.